C, and in accordance with Section 7E of the Open Meetings Act, this meeting will be held primarily virtually. At least one representative from the village is present at the Village Hall boardroom, and the virtual meeting will be simulcast for members of the public who do not wish to view the virtual meeting from another location. Pursuant to the executive orders issued by the governor, the number of people who may gather at Village Hall for the meeting is limited due to mandated social distancing guidelines and limitations on gatherings. Accordingly, the opportunity to view the virtual meeting at Village Hall will be available on a first come, first served basis. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Lake Bluff Business Advisory Committee. It's 7 p.m. Uh, Drew, would you please call the roll? Sure. Uh, Member Anderson is hopefully will join us later. Ms. Member Douglas? Mem I know you're, I think you're present, muted. but you're muted. You're Oh, sorry. Yep. Yeah. Here. <laughs> Thank you. Member Fisher. Here. Member Lawrence. Here. Member Lynch. Present. Member Osterlein will not be joining us tonight. Uh, Member Derossier. Here. Member Zaitsewitz. Solid ads? Here. Yeah, <laughs> great. Thank you. And Chair Markey. I'm here. Here. Okay, great. Okay. So you have a quorum. Great. Uh, next, uh, consideration of the minutes of the January 26th, uh, 2022 regular meeting minutes. Um, did anyone have any changes or comments or anything about the meeting minutes? I do for the record. I was present, but not available for comment. Okay. Noted. I, a Wi-Fi thing. <laughs> Technology. It's like a blessing and a curse. We're in a little island here, but I'm good now. Great, great. Anyone else? Nope. Okay. Uh, can we have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Thanks, Deb. Second. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. We need a roll call vote. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Roll call vote. Uh, Member Douglas. Aye. Member Fisher. Aye. Member Lawrence. Aye. Member Lynch. Aye. Member Durassier? Aye. And Member Zeitzwitz? Okay, um, at this point in the meeting, the chair and the committee allocate 15 minutes during this item for those individuals who would like the opportunity to address the committee on any matter not listed on the agenda. Each person addressing the committee is asked to limit their comments to a maximum of five minutes. Uh, so there's no one here in Village Hall. Do you have anybody? Actually, uh, Joanna Rolick, who is the executive director of the Lake Forest Lake Bluff Chamber, has joined this meeting. Um, I, I think she's here to chime in okay. at points, but not at this moment. Okay. <laughs> so. All right, great. We're grateful for her presence. Okay. Um, so the committee sets the order of the meeting. The chair and the committee will entertain requests from anyone present uh, on the order of business to be conducted during the board meeting. I think we only really have one... Uh, <laughs> one item that we're talking about tonight so i'm not sure that we need to change anything does anyone have any any requests okay let's get to it then uh, a discussion regarding the evaluation of the economy of the village and actions to promote the economic health of the business community uh, i think i'm just going to read this memo that drew circulated with the packet the um the plan that he sort of put together uh, just to get us started, and then we'll go from there. Uh, as you will recall, the BAC spent the January 26, 2022 meeting reviewing its mission, discussing how to best evaluate the economy of the village and identifying actions to promote the economic health of the business community. This brief but substantive body of work has been compiled into the attached draft report, which, once complete, will be delivered to the village board for their consideration. On February 23rd, 2022, it is anticipated that the BAC will review the attached report, further evaluate the local, current local economy, and continue identifying actions to promote the economic health of the village. So that's our goal for tonight. Um, and we can get started maybe by pulling out the plan and start uh, going through it. Hopefully everybody had a chance to to read the plan, everyone? Did you guys have a chance to read it? Yes. yes. 
Excellent. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, um, Drew, how would you like to start? Do you want to? Yeah. You want to just start rolling through it? Yeah, probably. I think. Um, I think as far as tonight, um, assuming that you're going to spend the next uh, hour and 50 minutes going through this, maybe the way is to break it off into two pieces. I, I think the the real meat of the conversation can be around the specific strategies, tactics, and tools starting at the bottom of page 15. There's a list of 23 items um, that have been, um, that were, I think, taken from the conversation um, at, at the last meeting and also based off feedback that I received from a number of VAC members uh, following that meeting. And then the other, uh, the balance of the meeting can be dealt with looking at, you know, the evaluation of the local economy, which starts on 19, but really deals with hard metrics, a list of, uh, that's where the list of um, particular um, data points, um, dashboard, if you will, um, it's probably, it's a pretty big dash. <laughs> and maybe you wanna narrow that down mm -hmm. um, into what you really wanna focus on and, and, and tying that perhaps to the actual strategies and tactics, I think could be, so it kind of work in tandem. Um, I will say that uh, Chair Marquis and I had a conversation earlier today, and you know this list of 23 items. Um, maybe there's a top, a top 10 list in there yes. that could really narrow the focus of this, and um, and or maybe the highest priority items even, and then maybe keep the others on a back burner. But so I, I think maybe it'd be helpful to have a, a smaller working list for this group to start off with, and. Yeah, I was actually thinking maybe we could um, we could each kind of take a take a turn and go through and talk about uh, maybe like our top five things out of this list of 23 that that we find important because I believe people will be coming from different angles depending on their backgrounds and the industry that they're in and so um, maybe we can whittle it down and as we see patterns of certain things um, surfacing, then we can whittle down the list to, you know, between eight to ten items that, that we really want to focus on. How does, how does that sound to people? Good? Would, sure. Sure. Would, okay. Great. Um, does, would anyone like to start? Anybody feel like they're ready to jump in and... Am I going to have to pick someone? <laughs> no, please. <laughs> Go ahead, Deborah. Go ahead. Um, well, can I just okay? Can I just add um, on the top of page fifteen where we're talking key partners? Um, one that I think could go on there would be, I don't know what the correct ter terminology would be, but some kind of philanthropic aspect of it because I think that the more we move into the world um, or continue into the world, um, public-private partnerships are becoming more and more mm -hmm. important. So, and they're not really identified here, I guess, but um, I know that a lot of communities use them off, awfully successfully to, and maybe we have too, and I just am not, I'm going a little bit blank, but I think public-private partnerships could be, and the ways to them could be ways that we, you know, help, help do some of this. I think um, I think that's interesting that you bring that up, Deb, because um, Drew and I were actually talking about that earlier this morning. About um, I, I think that we were one of the examples we were thinking of was the 125 committee and how that as True. a nonprofit worked with the village to beautify and and get some projects done that had been kind of kind of sitting for a while that were just waiting for a little movement and maybe a little a little bit of cash. So. I think that's a great one to add, and and I did want to I did want to let people know that if if you have any additions in the in the rest of the document that you feel strongly about, of course let us know and we'll um, add some of those things and discuss them. Um, certainly, like under the environmental scan on page ten, if you have anything you feel like needs to be added in that section, let us know, or in the in the SWOT analysis that we may have missed from the last meeting. Um, but um, that's a good point, Deb. Thanks, and we'll we'll add that in. Um, how about how about uh, under the specific strategies and tactics and tools? Did you have anything um, that you felt like were your top five out of that out of that list of twenty three? Um, well, one of the things um, I'd love to see the the village get more involved in promoting the commerce. 
you know, I think, again, if we look at some of the other communities around here, whether it's Highland Park is a good one to just kind of, if you get on their email list or you get on to things like that, they really seem to marry promoting commercial with being a municipality. And I know that for some people or for some communities, it seems like there's a really, you know, dark line between, oh, we're a municipality, we can't really promote the commercial. Um, but they seem to, you know, I mean, there are communities certainly that do it and do it awfully effectively, I think. And it's just another way of getting the word out about the, whatever the, you know, the commercial um, aspects of the village are, and they really make a point of doing it in their, you know, from everything from the newsletters, et cetera. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and then I guess the question that I have on some of these things, like number 14, a more aggressive approach to higher density housing, multifamily, et cetera, is just how do we, how do, we do that with the, the very vocal, not in my backyard kind of thing? So I guess that's one question that popped up to me that, um, you know, how do we work with that um, maybe more effectively? Um, and, um, but, you know, a lot of them, obviously, we want to commit to an economic development. We want measurable goals. We want to support high quality commercial and residential development, take a more aggressive approach to density housing. So I guess those would be okay. kind of the ones that I would be focusing on. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. And can I, and just, mm -hmm. if I may, um, Sure. Member Fisher, your your comment about the taking a more aggressive approach to higher density, you know, you know, you kind of brought up how might that be accomplished. Um, I think it'd be great to think about maybe the method and means, and it, it, mm -hmm. it and it can vary based off, you know, is the village a property owner in the particular site, which we are in some areas, right? And sure. that and sure. we can be much more aggressive in those and and do a solicitation for RFPs and involve adjacent property owners. Um, certain the village could be much more aggressive and use condemnation, right? But that's never, you know, that hasn't really come up, but that's certainly something uh -huh. out there. Um, maybe I, I think for this group and for the purpose of this, maybe it's identifying that, assuming that is a high priority item that this consensus, then we can think about method and means further. But I, I think there's, for again, for example, when the village is owner, that the village right. actually issue an RFP, you know, that... So, right. Uh -huh. Okay. Good point. And then the other, the promoting local business. Um, I, if you have a specific example, I would love to see that. If there's, you know, sure. the, the idea of like saying the, a restaurant in, you know, in the community of Highland Park and, and the, the city saying, hey, here's somebody come support them. Um, right. Yeah, I, I can definitely shoot you copies of the, I subscribe to several of the different communities email lists and they have, you know, frequently, for instance, Highland Park, I think it is, has a commercial um, e-blast that goes out on a regular basis. I don't remember how often they have a, um, then they have a, you know, more oriented toward the residential um, kind of commercial uh, restaurants, dining, um, shopping, et cetera. So I'm happy to copy it, you know, shoot it off to you and then you can pass them on or right. whatever. Yeah. And Deb, I just had a question about that. So are those, are those set up differently than like, say our Lake Bluff letter that goes out on Friday? So is it almost like a separate, um, more of a marketing commercial type of email or is it? Yeah, I think the way that, I think they sort of segment it. Um, okay. So there would be kind of the municipal thing and then there's more of their promotional arms and, you know, uh, different letters go out at different times, I think. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody, who is next? Who'd like to go next? Go next. Thanks. Um, okay, so if I picked the top 10, it'd be uh, maybe it'd be nine or, or 10. Uh, tend to start with. Um, I think, um, so I'll go through them quickly and then we can talk about them after. Uh, number one, uh, number four, um, I think five and 13 are similar or maybe could be combined into be in, into one. Uh, they both deal with kind of regulatory and zoning and stuff like that. Um, and then uh, hey, hey John. number seven. 
John. Okay. Yeah. Do, do you mind just reading them? You know, tell, tell, giving us the topic. Sure. Yeah. So number one is um, um, commitment and the support. consistent commitment and support for okay. long-term economic development. Um, I think that you know it's been certainly one of the things that's that's been maybe not very consistent over the last 15 years have been the things that could be done for the community to grow its um, its population, tax base, things like that. Okay. Um, and there's been a lot of different things that have been attempted and nothing actually gets, you know, gets finalized and gets done well. Communities around us are able to accomplish some of those larger projects and get some things done. Okay. Um, uh, number four, um, the high quality commercial and residential development. Um, you know, more businesses and more people um, while keeping while within keeping, you know, the overall goals of the community and, um, and it's small town focus, I think are important. It doesn't mean that we have to lose any of that stuff to grow a little bit. Um, both things I think can be done at one time. Um, so five and 13, um, the regulatory um, uh, environment and, um, and also reworking some uh, zoning, making things a little more streamlined and easy. Um, for instance, the thing that we just went through, you know, to deal with 500 square feet of space in our basement, we've had to go through two different zoning requests in 12 months, just to change from a storeroom to a bar to a takeout pizza place. Um, all of that extra work and time on everyone's side between the business and the, um, and the, um, you know, in the, in the village um, could be done in a more efficient way with a, with a, just a general scope and a framework that everyone can operate within. Um, and then uh, number six, which is, you know, kind of similar to number one, maybe those can be combined. Um, number seven, sorry, number six, yeah, six is basically like number one. Um, seven is a multi-pronged marketing plan. Um, I think that uh, we should figure out exactly what it is that we want to market and which parts of the community um, that we want to uh, market and how we want to uh, to bring in more people to the community, whether it's with special events or in general, um, you know, nighttime visitors to um, to the restaurant shopping community, different things like that. Um, but we should define what it is we want to market first and then lay out specific goals um, for how to accomplish that. Um, number nine, um, I think whichever way these three or four options in number nine end up working out or how much of each thing we decide to do is all up for debate. But I think defining specific goals of what the community should um, should work towards um, and then measuring ourselves and if we're meeting those goals or not, I think it's really important. Um, I don't think there's a, a whole lot of that in, in general um, in lots of ways. So um, if we are going to try to grow uh, as a community and still retain you know, who we are, um, what does that look like? What does it actually mean? Not just a theory of you know, let's add another house or two, like how many houses, how many people, and then can we, can we work to accomplish that? Um, uh, and then uh, number 11, um, which helps us achieve some of the things that we just talked about um, before. Um, how does the village make the best use of the space that it owns um, and, and helping get that space developed, whether it's a combination of um, tax incentives or something because I'm working with the land or helping with zoning with developers. Um, the village has different tools it can use to help get its own land that it owns developed um, into something because sitting as open land doesn't certainly doesn't advance uh, anyone's cause when it's a half a block area in the middle of downtown. Um, then I've got uh, number 14, which can go along with the previous number we just talked about. Um, some of the villages um, land might be able to do some higher density housing, um, whether it's, you know, apartments, condominiums, things like that. But there's certainly not a lot of that in town um, right now. Um, and then finally, uh, number 17, which is, you know, certainly small in the scale of some of the larger plans, but um, some ways to uh, encourage and or gently force everyone to park in the, in the back of the lot <laughs> um, and not have so many employees still parking on the streets or residents. I've seen more residents now um, parking on the streets. We started making a, we started walking around the village making a spreadsheet of all the same cars that we see um, parked out front. And I know that 
in general, the feeling is that the parking rules are normally enforced by our police department, um, but uh, they actually aren't enforced as, as, as much as it could be um, or at all. Uh, we've seen a number of cars, uh, both employees and people that live, live um, in the CBD parked on the streets of the CBD uh, every day for a number of hours. Um, so that certainly takes up parking for customers to come into town. Um, that and, well, that's it. That's all I'm going to say in parking. Um, I think that's about it. So those are the, those are the, the ones that I'd focus on and make, maybe, maybe take some of the ones that we have and combine them and, and refine it a little bit. Great. I, I just want to add to you, John, that, that was, thank you um, for that. That was a, a lot of information. Um, that some of the things that you brought up, I, I think that we can we can actually, when you look at our environmental scan on page 10, a lot of those, and, and Drew and I talked about a little bit earlier today too, about, um, so a lot of those are just, you know, very specific percentages or numbers, but sometimes what ties into that, and these were some of the things you were mentioning, John, too, are like amenities, uh, affordability, regulatory climates, th those kinds of like time and cost to open a new business, um, affordability. Uh, so some of those softer things tie into the environmental scan. So we might want to be thinking about those as we, when we move on to the next section, where we're looking at all the numbers and the vacancies, rental rates, tax receipts, that kind of thing. But we might want to have in the back of our head some of those softer things too that really do have an impact. I think, you know, parking has an impact. Um, so good. I think that's a, a great start. Uh, you know, one of the metrics that, that's come up, you've only gone through two, <laughs> it's come up twice, the idea about the, uh, if, if the uh, multi-family, you know, mm -hmm. more aggressive approach to higher density, there's no metrics in that list in terms of uh, types of housing, you know, quantity of units, yeah. you know, apartments, townhomes, like, you know, that, that would be a baseline. We, we, can, we have that number, but that, could, that should be a baseline metric we need to incorporate. And, and I think regulatory climate too. I, I don't know how everyone feels, but just uh, the, the ease, the time and cost of opening up a new business, um, and that would tie into, into zoning issues, I think. Okay, who'd like to talk next? I will, Gary Lawrence. Thanks, Gary. Um, just like to start basically as uh, in agreement with John's comments regarding number 17, which uh, again deals with the parking and the CBD. I mean, I'm downtown all day long and I just, I don't know what issues are strong out in the industrial park, which may be, you know, an issue too, but I'm just speaking to what I see all the time, which is where I work. And I totally agree with John on those issues that there is definitely a parking problem. So that, that stands out to me as something very important that still needs to deal with, even though I know in the past they've had some surveys that have said, oh, we don't see a, see a problem here. There's a problem. Um, and I think that came up last time with, uh, you know, Rob as well mentioning it at his building and behind it and they're, they're just issues. So I'd like to have that looked at uh, better. Um, the other uh, point I wanted to make was the combination of items, which uh, item number four, which was supporting the uh, high quality commercial residential development. Number 14, taking a more aggressive approach to the higher density, including family housing, condos, apartments. And number 15, I feel those three, possibly more, but at least those three could go all together. And 15 was working with the consultants, real estate professionals, et cetera. Some of these properties that are out there just, I think, sit way too long and there's not an aggressive approach to, uh, you know, help some of these uh, business owners or, you know, landowners to, uh, get them developed. Um, and maybe because there are restrictions, I mean, some of them just are, you know, restrictions of, we want two stories, not three stories, but whatever it is. Um, and lastly is item number 21, which is, uh, implementing projects in the village comprehensive land use plan. Um, I'm not sure when that was done, but obviously with, you know, 
things going on as they they do things change over time and uh you know just because the plans here doesn't mean we should just flat out implement it or suggest implementation as part of that you know without a tighter look at everything that's in that again you know i know it's been around for some time but you know yep yeah, and member cool. lawrence so you know and everybody else um that plan was first adopted in 1997 right and now yeah and there the truth of the matter is the village, you know, in terms of footprint really hasn't changed a lot since then. And, you know, it's makeup, it's, it's not that different, but um, to your point has village expectations or, or goals changed for land use and development. So there's actually money in this tentative budget that the finance committee has recommended. That's going to go to the village board in March to update that entire plan. Okay. That's what I was talking about. Yeah. Just yeah. so it just so it stays current. Yep. Yeah. All right. That's all for me. If I can pipe in a little bit. Um, parking is a reoccurring subject. Honestly, with the parking study that was done, I think Drew, you can correct me on the date, but I think it was in uh, for 2012, give or take. Um, the study was pretty clear. Um, the only way you make parking work is by enforcement and the village is not consistent with enforcement. Therefore, the parking, uh, people don't follow the rules. Hence you have, you know, employees parking in spaces that should be for patrons. Um, so it's, um, it's a matter of enforcement. And then our, I, I think we have adequate parking as long as enforcement is um, supporting it. Um, and it, it, I, then the report mentioned that very clearly that uh, enforcement is a key component to making parking work. And uh, as far as I can tell, it's, it's a very inconsistent um, situation there. Um, and I agree with the zoning that um, there's a lot of um, layers of regulation that become a deterrence more than um, an enhancement. So um, we've got to look at how to streamline that uh, to make, make it easier for people to uh, want to come into downtown and to do things. Um, and um, and as far as, you know, the, uh, some of the empty properties, um, you know, that's just, uh, that's a communication problem, I think, between, um, you know, residents and adjacent zoning areas that are residential adjacent to commercial areas. And, you know, it's, it's a flashpoint, no matter how you look at it. So it's really more of a public relations uh, issue that needs to be addressed there to, to enhance that uh, transition of, of development. Um, so those are my quick thoughts. Um, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> when you, when you talk about that piece about that communication piece, um, I think that's something that uh, that we, we talk about a lot on the village board is how do we communicate better and more efficiently with residents about uh, what we'd like to see developed and moving forward. And um, one, of, one of the issues we seem to always have, and correct me if I'm wrong, Drew, is that it, it, it will put out a lot of information and no one, no one really... Um, seems interested until all of a sudden we're right at the at the very end of whatever we're working at and then all of a sudden uh people show a lot of interest so we've we've grappled with for a long time i think trying to figure out how to engage people earlier in the process so that we can try and um create something that works for everyone that's a nice compromise and i think we're still struggling with that so i i think maybe that's something that we can look at we could tie that maybe into with marketing and communications of how how do we better communicate and and i think it's it's again not an easy answer but something that we should probably be um, focused on because 
I agree with that. And when it's, you know, one of those situations of it's in my backyard, well, those people are going to be a lot more vocal about it. Yeah. They always are, you know. Exactly. Well, and I might mention too, with my time on the park district board, um, messaging was so critical in a lot of the initiatives that I was involved with them. And that's getting out in front. Um, in, and, and we used a public relations firm to really craft the language in such a way that was really proactive. And, um, and a lot of it has to do with really doing a lot of groundwork, you know, and coming in the kitchen door kind of approach and sitting down at people's um, kitchen table and talking to them about it. Um, and so there's a lot of legwork involved too, I, no question. I, I, any of these sort of efforts um, require a, a lot of uh, initiatives, but I can tell you, um, at least with my experience, um, getting a, a good PR firm to help you craft the language properly um, can be a tremendous uh, advantage in promoting uh, a, a directive that you might be trying to achieve. Um, so, um, messaging is so critical and I think that's where I think we've kind of stumbled and, um, and then next thing you know, it, it becomes more than what you expected and, and now it's damage control, <laughs> you know, so, um, it's nice to be in a proactive role, not a reactive pro role. So. Agreed. Agreed. Thanks. That is that is uh, that's helpful and good information. Drew, did you have anything you wanted to? No, I, I, I mean I, I was thinking at the moment uh, when Member Douglas was talking about you know managing expectations of neighbors you know you, who purchase property adjacent to multifamily or central business district. That question of what did you expect would happen, <laughs> you know that that question. And I, I'm trying to recall in Lake Forest. Certain properties, there's uh, some sort of document that's signed. Deb, do you know what that? You know what I'm referring to? Yeah. Um, well, they just have a general document that says, um, you know, the city, you know, the city very much is in favor of historic preservation and uh, this, that, and the next thing. They did evolve, They did update that form a little while ago. Um, so they do ask that people sign that. I don't know how widely it's used, frankly, anymore. It kind of, I don't know that it's used as much in contracts. Was it and it's not anything legally binding. I mean, it's just really an A communication issue. piece, right? To manage expectations, right? To, yeah, to, to put it out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I dealt with that at the park board level when we were doing the whole paddle hut. And, you know, people bought homes, they're adjacent to the park district, and now they're, they're up in arms. And uh, it's like, wait a minute, it's like buying a, something near O'Hare Field and complaining about the airplanes. Um, you know, it, 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 this is a communication issue. And I think, um, um, and, you know, as I say, it, it's so important to stay in front of it not behind it oh. and um no it, and i yeah. that that's really not an answer to any of the issues here but i think it's a strategy that we, we need to seriously look at which will really help the downtown no and i think perhaps the comprehensive land use plan update could be a great vehicle for that um I, i'm thinking back to the visual preference survey right. the village was doing for the central business district and a lot of feedback and all the focus groups that were held for that and then when those recommendations flowed through the process and got to the advisory bodies they kind of became doa yeah. uh, a lot of them and those all those things which we're talking about which i, I would consider would be consistent with uh, the, the comments here taking more aggressive approach to higher density housing and multifamily, kind of got hit hit the skids and became instead of very specific objectives became general comprehensive land use plan you know, the village should, should support transitional residential. I mean, it was not as specific as the development community would prefer because they're all about certainty, right? The idea of they want to come in and say, if I come in and, and spend dollars on developing plans, I want a level of certainty. And that's, mm -hmm. that's very difficult with, without those other guiding posts, if you will, or uh, 
yeah, post to, to really guide them through the process. So, notes, good notes, thank you. Got Mr. Lynch and yeah, Mr. Lynch will say this. Hi. On thirteen and twenty-six, there's an interesting thing going on at the one seventy-six and forty-one interchange. It doesn't address people getting into town because of the railroad tracks. So if 176 is off limits, Green Bay Road, Sharon Road, and Moffat is the way to get there. I don't understand why uh, the study for 41176 stops at the railroad tracks. I sat on an advisory committee there and I think I was asked not to come back because I raised. <laughs> wait a minute. Oh, are, wait, are you talking? Oh, you're talking about the the forty one one seventy six with the I dot the phase one project. Uh -huh. I, I I I was asked to sit whatever, and I got asked not to come back because they didn't address the issue that there's a train there. Two times a day that shuts traffic down, and they're talking about accessibility to Lake Bluff. It didn't address anything. So if there's an interchange project going on, it's making it harder, in my mind's eyes, for people to get into Lake Bluff. You have Green Bay Road, you have Sharon Road, and Moffitt, if you're lucky. Funny one, I'm sure. But truthfully, accessibility to Lake Bluff is important. And if uh, it's not being addressed by a NIDOT thing, what good is it? So uh, were you thinking like having that cut and cover there or like, or elevating the train and make it a viaduct? What, what was your. Drew, they, I think they actually suggested that their study didn't go further than um, the train tracks. Right. So if they you didn't want to get involved with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really? So they said our study's not any further east of the railroad tracks for a vet or whatever yeah they're gonna they're gonna tear that place up and it's not going to correct an accessibility to lake bluff so we're still gonna have to wait for a train which is twice a day and a turnabout or however it ended up and you can get to lake bluff by green bay road sharon road and maybe Moffat. i, I feel so like if we're trying to get people to come downtown Accessibility, in my mind's eye, is a, you know. I feel like at one point we we talked to Jeff Hansen about. We asked the question about going over, building something over those tracks or allowing more accessibility, and the issue was that it that it couldn't sustain that because of one because of forty one being right there. I can't I can't quite remember exactly the conversation, but there was an issue with the actual engineering and, and uh, angles of how you would build it, it, it wasn't possible, it wasn't viable. To, to me, it was highly suggestive that their study didn't go any further than. Right, right. Like they would be the people who would be able to, IDOT would be able to figure that out if they're actually going and moving things around, you would think they could address that. I, I um, haven't sat there because I was, uh, curious why they're not even thinking about the train tracks as part of the issue it shuts down the road 176 that's a major thoroughfare mm -hmm. or a major artery what do you want to... well and there's certain parts and of the day there's certain parts right there. of the day there that it's that the road is heavily congested especially between like 3 30 and 4 o'clock my, my last understanding about that whole interchange was there was going to become a, a couple of turnabouts you know, you get off northbound, turn about, get on south uh, northbound, and get off southbound, and go south again. But no, no attention was paid to what happens if there's a train there. Mm -hmm. Kind of funny to me. Well, <laughs> they, they yeah, this is the plan that was approved coming through that phase one process, and where you see the two. Um, signals at Shagbark and at Skokie Valley Road. 
uh, Jeff's right. That it, they were very close um, to having those intersections be roundabouts. And, and that was the recommended design from the committee. Jeff, forgive me, I, I don't remember you being asked to leave. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I, I stopped going. Okay. Okay. I stopped going because they weren't listening to a problem. In okay. my mind's eye, here's the deal. So yeah, I want to get to Lake Bluff. You know, I'm coming from Chicago. I'm coming from Kenosha, whatever the case may be. I get off and I'm going to go east on 176. Mm -hmm. There's a train there and it stops everything. Yeah. And they were the reason why the, the, the roundabout design did not get approved. And it, it slowed down the phase one process by, I want to say like three years, was yeah. that they were studying the impacts of roundabout users and would they, so for example, people driving through the roundabout and, and stacking up in queue and a train approaches. They're, they're worried, this is the traffic division, yeah. the, the engineers were like, they were worried that people would not be familiar with that enough to move forward and would, there would be an accident. And that's why ultimately they said, we need to have a signal there so they can control the number of vehicles better than the roundabout, which to your point, Jeff, it, it moves traffic a lot more efficiently. Um, but if a, train, if a train is not studied as part of the IDOT thing, yeah. And there's one of our major arteries to get people to come to Lake Bluff yeah. for anything, shopping or hanging out. Um, yeah, my doesn't work. or leaving Lake Bluff. <laughs> yeah, well, so there's an advantage. No, uh, so, so but but the uh, IDOT, I think they they behave the way they did because they don't control the trains either, right? That's federal government. And they sure. have to they have to take that into account. Sure. Yeah. They were, they were highly suggestive that they're studying going any further east than the railroad tracks. Yeah. Which I, I all of us have been involved with, you know, trying to go east or west and the, yeah. the train binds things up. So to go downtown Lake Bluff to do something easy as shopping or dinner and not be able to leave going westbound or eat, it's like silly to me. And when it's backed up, we turn around on Ava Court and we go either 137 or Deer Pass. Everybody does, you know, we, we seem to decide to go somewhere else. And what I want to do was I want to go in town. Kind of funny one for me. <laughs> So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna write that down. Talk about pursuing um, cut and cover or some other ways to reduce or eliminate the barriers that the railroad creates. I think. Um, it, sorry. Oh. I I think is is uh, is not um, it's not that terrible to wait there. Um, the worst part is that you don't have nothing nice to look at when you are waiting. <laughs> It's kind of a, it's, it's um, because in many towns you have to wait and, you know, if you are going to have dinner and you have to, you, you know, it's not a big deal. Sometimes if you are living there, it's more because you said, oh my gosh, it's, it's, it's 10 and, and I know that I'm going to get the train 10, 15 and you want to be there before that, that time. But for new people that come to town, I don't know if it's really important, but really it's a very sorry but ugly area and it's uh i i think that is the worst part it's like a um it's not it's not pleasant when you have to wait there for that long but um i i totally understand but i don't know if that is going to change the the that somebody's going to go to lake bluff or not because of the train you know it's it would be great if the train goes over, but uh, or they're down and the cart's over. But um, I think it, maybe we can make that area nicer and make the the, the entrance a little more uh, clean. I I don't know. I I think it's a big surprise when you get when you pass Sheridan and you see what you see in Lake Bluff because you don't expect that. The the whole road is pretty. I think n not nice. I think there's 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 a few access points to Lake Bluff, and we're trying to get people to come there. 
and that's just a, a bundle. It's, there's, there's nothing good about it. No. Yeah. And if there's a whole interchange study going on, actually, they haven't addressed the idea that, you know, um, traffic gets bundled up there. Who, who, who wants to um, sit through that to go and get uh, a cup of coffee or a hamburger? It's, we're trying to bring people in town and we're limited by the access points. Sharon Road, Green Bay, Moffitt, if you're lucky. Kind of funny to me. But on a positive note, <laughs> uh, mean, Drew, well, Drew, thank you for at least getting this uh, Buckthorn eradication yeah, along um, 176 done, because I, I have to admit, when I went on the park board in 09, that was one of the things I was working with our executive director on to try to see what we could do to open up those long views to the north. And I know there's a lot of chipping to be done, but um, what's been cleared at this point is such a huge improvement, um, enhancing at least the corridor from the railroad tracks east up to Green Bay Road. Um, yeah. This is fantastic. So that, that's a great positive. So that's great to sure. hear. Yes. Great to hear. Yeah. I think I think we're doing we're planning on beautifying that even more. We were we were one of the things that um, we talked about today was the possibility of as you come under the viaduct making the the railroad bridge look nicer. I, I mean that's an easy something that we can do to beautify entering Lake Bluff, which is just painting essentially painting that bridge. And if we wanted to, um, putting some signage up there that lets people know, I, I, I know Lake Bluff encompasses more than just the east side, right? But, but having some sort of um, artistic something there that lets you know you're coming into kind of the, the, the village part, the, the quaint part of Lake Bluff. So, we, and we've talked about that. I think that those are all viable options to make things. It's not right by the tracks, Soledad, but at least as you're coming in, you're, you're, the, the corridor is being cleaned up, it's being beautified, and then as you come under the, the viaduct, you would, it, it would be an entry, a nicer entry point than what we currently have. Rob, yeah, I, I know, I tried to I know find your, well, go, go ahead, ahead, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, Rob, sorry to interrupt you. I was gonna say, I tried to find your photo of that bridge. Was it outside Philadelphia? Uh, oh. It is um, Ardmore. Ardmore. Um, Couldn't think of it. Ardmore. Ardmore. Yeah. And, and uh, it's just south of uh, Villanova, which um, Soledad knows because she's got a, one of her kids there, um, or it was there. I'm not sure if she's graduated yet or not. But um, but the point being, um, I know ideas are cheap, but um, that railroad track at you know uh, uh, that uh, Jeff's been talking about, that could become a great opportunity as a gateway element, um, and um, my thinking is that those, that road, the road would probably have to go underneath those tracks. I don't think the Union Pacific is going to be particularly cooperative with messing around with their rails. That, but, but if if one could, I, I I'm not an engineer, but if it could go underneath, um, oh. yeah, there's Ardmore. Um, now, I this is a little Coney Island like, so let's not <laughs> over overthink this. I think all the lights underneath are a little excessive, but the signage is what uh, was something that really intrigued me. Um, and what's done here um, is the signage is sitting on a, a steel tube beam about maybe a foot off of the bridge. So it doesn't touch the bridge at all, which is in our case, uh, Union Pacific property. So um, this might be a way of having, you know, some separation so that, and what you can do basically, I, what the Union Pacific does with the bridge is their business, but we could at least enhance it um, in right. front of the bridge. Um, and then you look at the signage, you're not looking at the bridge anymore. Yeah. Um, but I always thought, and, and by the way, these viaducts, uh, there are these underpasses they have on the, um, uh, the main line coming out of Philadelphia are very similar to what our bridges look like. So, um, so when my daughter was at Villanova, I, I couldn't help but look at this and go, wow, that's a great idea. What it costs, I can't tell you. Um, 
but at least they did keep it separate from the bridge. It's not attached to the bridge. So um, that might be, um, you know, a way of, you know, working with the Union Pacific without interfering with their, um, you know, encroachment of, of property that they own. But um, yeah, um, but who knows, maybe that could be something down, more down toward um, 41 as a gateway. Um, if, if I doubt were to help us um, take 176 underneath the rails uh, of the, of the Union Pacific. So I know this is big, you know, big picture stuff, but um, that would be a really natural gateway element. Rob, all due respect, I, I think most of the people that go to Lake Bluff travel 176 in and out of town, no, whether it's going to Target or, or you know, to gymnastics or whatever, people run that road more than I think Sheridan Green Bay Road or, or whatnot. Right. I agree. And, and I like that. <laughs> if we're trying to create interest. <laughs> but yeah, there you go. Yeah, you know, I, if, I, if there was I, some sort of co op, even, even, if, sorry. Go ahead, please. Even if there's some cooperation with uh, rail times or something, why, why can they not do um, you know, the, the coal or whatever they're hauling up there twice a day uh, in off hours? Uh, 176 is a gateway. It, you, 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 you get welcome to Lake Bluff off of 41. It's going to be a big interchange change in our lifetime. And you're going to be bundled. Why? 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 What? I would be suggestive that maybe um, the railroad needs to be challenged because that's like the backyard to people coming to town. I I wouldn't argue that at all. I just got a feeling the. Union Pacific is a whole nother animal um, to deal with. And I, because I know even when it comes to moving freight, they don't care about passenger trains. They just want to move freight. Right. And um, and I don't know. I, I don't know what the jurisdictions are around all that. But I, I think, yeah, if they would cooperate, it'd be great. I just, you know, that's a head scratcher. I don't know. <laughs> that might be spent right now to open up the Vista just after you go over the railroad tracks. It's pretty. I mean, they're chipping wood even today. I, I can see, I'm not sure what hole it is. I, I can see facilities out there. It's nice. It's open and expansive, but, but if you have to wait for that on a given day, it's kind of silly to me. Yeah, well, good point. It's a good point looking at it. Is there a process that, um, that the rail lines have for working with them and asking for certain things to get done? Uh, for instance, is there a process that Metro has for asking for the bridges to be, you know, to be painted um, and cleaned up and beautified as you come underneath, come into town there? Is there a way to contact them and actually start that? That that painting is not that difficult. They'll give you a permit to do that. For example, when Lake Forest first had the, um, was it the Western Open out uh, off 60, mm -hmm. they uh, hired... Nice. Yeah, they hired uh, was the BMW. Yeah, okay. yeah, they yeah. hired they hired a, a firm to come in and paint the bridge um, because they knew it was going to be on television. <laughs> and I think it was I think it was like sixty thousand um, dollars. But they can it's that's one thing that the UP will do, um, and they'll they'll issue permits for that. That's not that difficult, you know. Signage. I, I spoke with the person at Ardmore about that sign when Rob showed that to me a few years back. And they quoted how much they paid for it, and it's shocking. I mean, I think it can be done for a lot less than what they paid for it. But um, I think that could probably be done as well because it's not it's not a structural issue. It's, I mean, it, it's you know, it's like art being you know attached. It's not a big deal. I, I think that could be done. Um, so uh, all those things I think are, are doable. Um, I think it's true, but the bridge is owned by by Metro, right? No, Union Pacific. Sorry, uh, so, they, they, but, so they own the bridge, mm -hmm. okay. and they're generous enough to give us a permit for us to fix and retouch up and paint their bridge. <laughs> Listen, they are gracious enough to come in and 
and, they have a backwards. And, and repair their bridge because it's dropping debris on pedestrians and vehicles, we have to beg them to do that. Uh, and so, in, in fact, so at spring break, uh, so it's the week, March 21st, the bridge is going to be closed during the day because they're going to be doing repairs to stop the debris from falling on pedestrians. That's great. Um, um, is that going to be closed in both directions of traffic? Yes. <sighs> it's, it's like from nine to three, those hours. And for the record, for the record, Deer Path will also be closed because the ped, the, the bridge, uh, there's a pedestrian bridge, you know, that north-south trail that goes right under the high tension ComEd power lines. ComEd yeah. actually owns that pedestrian bridge that's part of that trail system. They're going to take that down and set a new bridge there that week. So it's wow. going to be, it's going to be a busy week. <laughs> so can't get there from here that week. It won't be busy for the communities east of um, the road for sure. Yeah. So I would just say this: we're, you know, um, we're meeting together. Activity in Lake Bluff, and if the accessibility isn't corrected, what happens? You know, I mean, that, you know, I'm number four on. on 13 is uh, access to the North Shore. So we can get there without any issues on Green Bay Road, on Sharon Road, and those coming from, you know, the South Moffat. But if, if there if there is a access issue on 176, I don't get it. Sorry. Yeah, definitely noted. It's a good point. It's a growth limitation issue, no question. Yeah. It's been, you know, th it's been under study for now 20 plus years, I'm suggesting. Uh, and they, they don't the is not necessarily, you know, getting off and getting on 41. It's getting east to Lake Bluff train stops and there's 75 cars or whatever, eastbound, westbound, it's, you know, um, I think it should be pushed. I, I will tell you anecdotally, Jeff, I, I'm not gonna argue with you that it's it's certainly far from perfect. Um, but my recollection is, is that in the last, I wanna say three years, the number of stoppages, extended stoppages has been down because we get complaints about it. I think it's gotten better I don't know if that's a function of um, the economy, but I know the economy has been very up. And um, so when, when the economy is doing well, they're shipping, you know, durable goods and, and commodities. So, um, but we, we should have some data on interruptions because we, we, the police department will have some of that and, and the number of interruptions and the, and the FRA has some rating of trains. So we can, that's a data point we can start, we can look at and add. Jeff, I also, I just, a point of clarification, you talk about the other access points. I'm not familiar with complaints, concerns about Sheridan Road, Moffitt. Um, it's not necessarily a complaint, Drew. It's just the, uh, you know, the, the arteries, for lack of a better description, to get yeah. to Lake Bluff, our choices are small. You know, if, if the, if, if the uh, Metro Bridge uh, floods, your choices out of town are Moffitt and Sharon Road. Yeah, true. Yeah. In certain, certain towns, that's by design. Mm -hmm. I mean, Rob, you know, they, I think of Deer Path, right? You know, it's one small road road in by design. Um, that's not necessarily true for Lake it, Bluff. Uh, I think some people in Lake Bluff would say that. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, and and uh, the yeah. comprehensive land use plan has language in there that talks about 176 from the intersection east, don't ever add lanes. You know, the idea of keep mm -hmm. it like it is. Um, so that, that's, to your point, I mean, you know, to uh, open up the restrictor more, that's a way it can, could be done. It's not the cure because you're still on the other side of the railroad tracks one way or the other, but capacity is capacity, you know, so. 
And I, I, th I think, I mean, when you, when you start talking about doing that widening roads or, you know, uh, you have to look at the ripple effect of just the, the, how many children are in bikes and kind of the walkability and the accessibility of our community in different, other than a car. Uh, which is not to, not to say that that we couldn't look at that and, and kind of think about how it could work, but we also need to think about the other factors of of some of the things that make Lake Bluff special from the standpoint of how our children use the village and how how people move around the village other than by vehicles. So I think um, we definitely we definitely should be looking at accessibility. In fact, I was thinking we should add accessibility under the environmental scan. As one of the categories, I think um, that was in there. Was it? Yeah, it was um, hidden in there somewhere. I think it was a threat. Um, da, 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 da. Well, and I think as you're saying, it'd be accessibility with a balance. Right. Deer I path in 41 forest has always caused conflict. Okay. We had, you know, uh, the hundred year storm, which happens every three months. <laughs> Lake Forest has spent, I drive by it all the time, and I can see there's a major construction uh, by the Deer Path Golf Course and yep. on both sides, you know, traveling east, there's a big retention pond being built, and then going closer to a, a golf, there's another retention pond there, and all those retention ponds end up at a pump station, which is just east of the railroad tracks mm -hmm. on the south side of Deer Path. Yeah, I think that was all I dot money. Wasn't it true? It was. Yeah. It, yeah, it, and then it, it was. It, it hands, is. It? And um, our project was actually to replace the pump station at 41 and 176 was going to be let at the same time. And both projects got hung up because there is a buy American requirement in federal government procurement. If you're using their dollars, you have to use American made domestic made pumps. And, yes. <laughs> and yeah, so the problem was that this there was no domestic pump manufacturer or German only, I think, at that size and scale to actually work for these situations. They, they filed an appeal. The, the feds did not support their appeals. So the workaround was that Lake Forest said they would be willing to take control of that asset and they say we only work with these German pumps and so we need that you need to uh, release that so then the state ended up using their dollars from a different kitty to pay for that and got that project moving based on that uh, in fact I was on the phone with IDOT this week who we were having a conversation about reaching out to our federal leaders to try to get our waiver heard they won't hear our waiver because they're considering rule changes so it can't even get be considered so your, you know, government, your government at work, people. <laughs> so, bureaucracy is a beautiful thing, huh? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, from your own perspective, though, uh, yeah. Deer Path is you know, a, a major artery, for lack of a better description, to Lake Forest. And if it's not working, then people aren't going downtown. Or getting, to, or getting to the community hospital, right? That, that was another reason that got yeah, pushed cool. forward. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so if, if if we're looking to bring people in town and we have this functional problem, a railroad track, maybe there's an opportunity for, you know, um, IDOT or I don't know. I mean, I really don't know, actually. Thinking out loud. Maybe, maybe there's an opportunity for some monies to open up the corridor. That is probably, if, if somebody would do a study, I would be highly suggestive that most people go east, west, and 176 getting like Bluff than they do on any other road. And if it gets shut down because uh, the new business development, uh, I'm not going to stop there and wait for a train to go downtown and buy a t shirt at Ola. Opinionated, I'm sorry. <laughs> you, it is noted for certain. Did you did you have anything did you have anything else Jeff did you have any out of all those out of all the um the things that were listed there outside of the corridor did you have anything else that kind of stuck out to you 
It seemed important. I'm okay. I'm, I think I'm okay. Okay. The answer be no. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Soledad? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the work on 176 with the clearing. <laughs> I love it. I love Good. it. Got it. Thank you. Very pretty. No, I, I, I had the, the same thing. I was thinking, um, okay, parking, we all know. I don't, I don't think that I have anything new to say. Um, I would love to see 176 nicer. Um, I, I don't know, like with lighting or some, uh, I don't know, some, some kind of, or, or maybe trees and, and lighting all the way from 41 to downtown. I think it would be great. And also, I feel like it could give, um, it could uh, raise maybe the the neighbor, the the, uh, the west side of Lake Bluff. Uh, I think it would it could look nicer. It could be if if it had like a a nice entrance to that area. I don't know how to say it, but like I feel like if you go through through a very like a a, a street with many. Um, uh, trees and and good lighting and and then you 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 have to turn to go to those neighbor the, the neighborhoods it would be much nicer than in the way that that is presented today that you can see some old some new some it could give a very nice entrance to the town and also i think it it, it could the other the other part of the neighborhood could look nicer i don't know if i'm clear yes Maybe you Rob, you can help me. <laughs> well, it's. I think you're talking about really having um, um, a lure uh, to your eye to draw you in. And, yes. Um, and don't you so think when, that? It's so when you're in your car, you're going, well, "What's what is this? Let, let me let me go farther and see what it is." Yes, and I think it's going to look nicer before in the, the west side. It's going to look much nicer. Uh, that, that it looks now because you can see some old, some new, and some some of the houses are are very very uh, are beautiful. Some others are very old, and and I think that would make all very even and and more beautiful. Thank you. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Great idea. Lots of consensus. That's good. Yeah, a lot. I was just going to say, like, I feel like we did get I, some things came up to the top, you know, um, zoning, housing, uh, multi multifamily housing, different types of housing, um, parking, um, marketing and communications, beautification, beautification. Yeah. Can anyone think of anything else that kind of came to the top? I heard regulatory, you know, right. Streamline. Yeah. 176. Yeah. 41. Very helpful. Yeah, because all these ideas really go toward um, encouraging and enhancing um, private industry to engage. If, if you can create an environment where they, they're drawn in because of um, incentives uh like what we've been talking about i think it'll go a long way that really is where i i feel government plays a great role um so you know it's interesting um I, the the evolution of the community and the community's expectations for beautification and improvements continues to evolve and the bar keeps getting higher which is great <laughs> you know but it it grows and grows and grows um, but I, I, I'm just thinking about even the area between the viaduct and Green Bay Road, the south side of the road, you know, that's a little wild and that it could be, you know, more manicured and more consistent with the rest of the gateway. Um, but it, it's, you know, it's, it's been, I nothing agree with that, Drew. Yeah, yeah, I agree. yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. I mean, There's your second phase of Buckthorn <laughs> right? rotation. Yeah, but I mean, something as simple as that, I mean, that's a couple hundred yards and it's, it's doable. And, it, and, you know, you couple that with painting the bridge and doing some things and that corridor is, you know, leaps and bounds from where it was six months ago. 
Exactly. And by the way, buckthorn is not even an indigenous plant. Uh, mm. The British brought it here <laughs> for hedges. And I guess back in the day, buckthorn, when you would, uh, it made great charcoal so you could make gunpowder. Oh, is that so, right? Yeah. So it's it's here for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you to the Brits for that. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, well, I, I think I can, I mean, if, if you want to jump to the uh, evaluating. Metrics? Yeah, the metrics. Um, I don't know if there's any surprises in any of that data. I mean, um, I mean, I think it's very interesting at the bottom of 21, it's, you know, coming out of COVID that the village continues to hit, be all time highs with sales tax and food and beverage tax. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. That's not the case in a lot of places. Drew, I just have a question. Um, is any of this available anywhere or is this just being pulled together now? I, I think it would be nice if people who are looking to come here with businesses or something could access whatever it is we decide they should access and just make it readily available. Yeah, this these were pulled. I mean, this data was all available either through the villages on our own finance uh, monthly finance reports um, or um, other uh, we, we got all the retail office and industrial flex vacancy rates you know we, we participate with Lake County partners they provide that information to member communities um, but there's no reason like again like we could that's part of this is the communication of the village as a successful right. place and a desirable place to do business, we can create those, put this, you know, at a glance on our website. You know, we have that exactly. at a glance. Yep. Right. I th and have a commercial area yep. that yep. people could look at. I think too, I think too, if you looked in the uh, SWOT analysis under, under weaknesses, one of the things listed there was out of date dated materials to give prospective businesses. So right. I feel like maybe this is something these these numbers are something that we can also somehow incorporate with the marketing and they could have a they could have a little maybe a little offshoot where they they put together a little packet clearly on the internet mm -hmm. is much easier yeah. but if somebody right. actually wanted something in hand we could we could probably pull something together pretty quickly and update those materials i noticed that when i was reading through the the weaknesses section uh, the other day just had, had a, uh, a question too regarding the update on the materials. That parking survey that was done, do you know offhand what year that was done when uh, the last time? I mean, there have been a lot of 14, changes. 2014. 14. And so there is actually in also in this tentative budget that's being recommended, mm -hmm. there is an update of that plan this year as well. Yeah. All right, good. The retail makeup of the stores is is pretty different right now than it was yeah, seven, eight years ago. Yeah. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Hey, Drew, I, I have a question. Part of that, they can talk to some of our business owners, like John, myself, you know, Rob, people that are in town, to say, you know, what do you see as as a problem here? You know, it's, even the library parking, you know, their situation, or you know that parking over by uh, the old Northern Trust, those eight spaces, you know, what, what to do, what, what suggestions do we have? Do they have whatever? I, I'd like to be involved with it, you know. Are you talking just specifically parking, just about the parking issue that you'd like to? Just that parking, okay. yeah, the, that okay. parking part is part of it, yeah. Well, and then one other thing is when you, when you do pull this together, when it gets pulled together, you know, there's definitely opportunities to do sort of advertorials and things even like cranes, you know, or whatever we decide is the target for some of this stuff, um, where, you know, it, it's not editorial necessarily, but it's kind of advertorial where we are, you're, you know, you pay for it, um, but it does get out in front of an audience that may be the right audience, maybe cranes isn't it, but, you know, I'm sure there's people who could give advice on where that should all be placed. Yep. Drew, I had a quick question. Um, do you do you have an, uh, just a ballpark idea of where the large increase in sales tax revenue came from 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 all the other years and, and, and increasing in 2021? Because it, it goes through a pretty significant jump. Is do we know what what industry or what sector that came from? Yeah, I wasn't thinking it was canals. You know. <laughs> well, you know, surprisingly, the uh, I think it is mostly auto. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, there's been, you know, the stark market, when it does well, you know, there's connection, people are buying new cars. <laughs> that's, that's, we see that a lot over time. Um, but uh, I, you can see um, the, some of the big jumps start in 14. That's when Target, you know, that's the incremental. There's a quarter of a million out of, you know, straight in there, and that's been growing. Uh, when Target showed up, that, so that elevated the baseline. And I think the, you know, the, 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 the incremental increase is auto sales. And they've changed the way the state um, taxes used cars as well. So we're getting a bigger piece of that too. So even though, you know, the overall availability of new vehicles ha is limited, um, the, as in most, if you're trying to buy even a, a, you know, a used car, you know that you're paying a premium on that and it's really almost taxed like a new car. So it's the village's share of that. You know, the, I think we talked about we were expecting based off, we have conversations with our dealers, you know, hey, how are things going? What can we expect this, you know, calendar, this, this you know, calendar year or quarter? And, um, you know, they, they were like, well, it's, it's, it's gonna be similar to last year, which was surprising to us because it was so high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but, you know, they think, it, you know, things would get back to normal in some way, the third quarter of 2023, you know, so it's, it's only, yeah. I mean, if this is normal, our new, is a new all time high, you know, our baseline keeps growing which is great because those types of dollars are the dollars that are more um, available and, and to be used for capital infrastructure. I mean, that's, if we can keep operations flat and then we can, you know, find better ways to put the money into capital into exi existing or new assets. Along that thought, do you know if there's any, um, if there's, if they have any plans to look at replacing uh, the Hyundai and the mini dealerships that were moved out? You know, I have conversations with those owners like I, from time to time. And, I, you know, the general answer is when it makes sense, they'll do it. Uh, they, you know, uh, certainly uh, w William Madden has been a very astute businessman and has made moves that have made sense uh, every step of the way um, for him and the village. And I, I mean, I think the numbers tell the story. <laughs> so, he's, you know, he, he seems to be doing well and picking up labels and putting away labels when it makes sense. And, um, so, uh, you know, I think, you know, one of the bigger questions is, you know, with electronic ve electric vehicles and that shift in the marketplace and it's, what does that mean for the village long term? And, and um, there, there's lots of different views on that. And I've seen, you know, it's the end of, you know, gas powered vehicles as we know it to, uh, to the other side of the spectrum um, to it's probably somewhere in the middle is where it's going to land. So, um, so it's a long answer is um, we talk with them about it. They, they, you know, we haven't been involved or be, we're, we're not other than just communication. You know, if we can do something, you know, we always say that if we can do something to help, let us know. I mean, the village has done economic incentive agreements for dealerships. That's one of the areas that in, in large sales tax generators like Target. Um, and so we have done use those tools to support and add new uh, producers of sales tax. Um, so that's a tool that the village has and will continue to use, I suspect. Drew, do you, do we have any electric charging, any of those fast electric charging stations here? I know some of the targets are getting them. Um, we don't, and we talked about that. Um, and the general think right now is the village has incentivized permitting to make it easier and less expensive for people to do improvements at their homes, to charge them at homes. And I, I think generally speaking, the um, planning world and professionals have argued against putting those in public parking spaces. Um, but the one place that if the village was going to put them is assuming that someday that people will start using the train again with more regularity where they're gonna leave their car for extended periods of time. That would be one place to do it but not in the downtown where, cause people aren't going to come in and charge and, you know, go and walk into JDR and buy a bottle of bourbon and, and you know, for five minutes and plug in the car. That, that's just not how it's done. So. I just read something about that. There's a real um, sort of desert between somewhere in Lake County along 41. And I think it's Highland park is the next place. So if people were looking to do something, yeah, you know, is that anything that could be some kind of an attraction for, any reason. I don't know enough about it, but 
Yeah, we haven't been by approached by any, you know, developer owner of property saying we'd like to do okay. this. So. Okay. I was just wondering too if some of our sales taxes increased just due to generally to inflation, because there's, there's some of that. Sure. Are, yeah. You know, if the the X has gone up, right? Yeah. So if that comes down a little bit, the twenty to twenty one figure looks pretty substantial. Yeah, well, that yeah, that's what that we talked about that, you know, the missing amount, um, you know, during the COVID crunch, it's like, you know, it, it looks like it was it was climbing, then it hit the pause button, and then it jumped up where it should have been if it was continuing at the normal rate, right? Yeah. But we're I mean, this fiscal year, we're tracking a half a million dollars higher. Yeah, already, even higher. Has there been any conversation about real estate transfer tax? I know some communities have really benefited from that with, and it's becoming so common that I don't know that it would really have so much of a negative onus. It was talked about a few months ago at the finance committee meeting, the village is exploring a creation of a stormwater utility to fund, uh, to, to Jeff's point earlier about the viaduct flooding, um, this, that we know a solution for that is gonna cost about 15, 17 million dollars. And stormwater uh, infrastructure does not have a dedicated revenue stream like water system, you know, you pay a water bill, there's, a, there's an ongoing revenue feeding those uh, assets. There's not such mm -hmm. a thing for stormwater. Um, we know that our existing stormwater is undersized. You know, we talked about the 100 year storm, what it was three years ago is now, you know, it's like really like a 150 year storm event. So that the, the benchmark has moved. So we know that mm -hmm. every, everything in the ground is already inadequate, right? So um, right. we need to build on those systems and we know we need new infrastructure to support the existing problems we know today. So identifying revenue streams, that was, stormwater utility fee and then the idea of doing it also in conjunction with a real estate transfer fee was a way to you know really find a lot of dollars quickly um, to fund those activities i think the group right now is more focused on the stormwater utility fee uh, i think there was some i'll call it hand wringing over having introducing two new revenue streams at the same time okay uh, mm -hmm. And so, um, but it's, it's been examined and it is, there is a lot of opportunity there for sure. Yeah. Lake Forest has had a bonanza this year for sure. In the past I, couple of years. Yeah. yeah. Deb, do you feel, do you feel like from the real estate industry, you just, it seemed like you indicated that, 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 that transfer tax seems to be something that's now just most people expect it, uh, that it's, well, it's I mean, it's, it, yeah, most communities do charge one. So. You know, I don't, I think in the past it was, we were afraid we would lose business, you know, or we would lose sales because people wouldn't want to pay that. I think it's so much the norm now. Granted, obviously there's thresholds to how much it could be, you know, it's $4 per thousand in Lake Forest and sort of in that realm, most of the communities around here and it switches between who pays it, buyers or sellers. Very often it's buyers that pay it. Okay. Um, so and you can get a rebate if you buy and sell you know within a time frame and that kind of thing but it doesn't seem to have the negative and it's kind of an easy way for a municipality to make some additional cash okay that's that's helpful thank you uh -huh. yeah. um do you want to talk anymore does anyone else have any more comments about the the, uh, the metrics, any other thoughts? You know, certainly based I, off the consensus so far, yes. I, I can go back and look and make sure there's alignment so that, you know, at least whatever these points, we can find some metric tied to them. So I can go back and, and for the next meeting, I could edit this report to more reflect these okay. and, and make it a little more user-friendly view, you know, uh, read. And, I think that's great. And, and tie those to it and then um, get that to the group and kind of maybe get to a, look, start looking towards like a final edit. How, how does everyone feel about that? Fair enough. Good. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me just put one thought there um, as we kind of start compacting this thing down and and then we need to really just uh, boil it down to a lot like what Ronald Reagan would say that uh, if you can't say what you want to say in 15 seconds, no one will listen to you. <laughs> and, you know, so we got to really then kind of really condense it to a point where we have a real concise um, message. message. Um, I agree. And otherwise, yeah, people, their attention spans are short. <laughs> oh. Maybe we can put it on Snapchat somehow. Well, I, I'm, I'm adding an executive summary. <laughs> but I do have one quick question sure. um, on, on what we, on I think our very first meeting, Drew, we um, were reviewing um, uh, a new version with that block one streetscape. And then I saw that, um, and we had our comments on it. And then I saw that um, the village board approved that scheme with a one-way street west. Is that now gone into um, uh, uh, the grant process? Is that what's happened? Yeah, so it, yes, it, it, that particular project has been submitted for a grant. I am not confident that the village is gonna be awarded that from that grant program. Um, but it was submitted in a way that acknowledged that um, this is a concept plan and that, that there would be a final, final um, design, you know, whether it would be two way or one way, that was still an open concept. Um, and the board, when they approved it, they, you know, they said, look, it's a concept. This is not, you know, this is not a bid document, right? We're not approving a plan. It, it, it was a concept. So um, I, I think there was, um, there was, I think, general comfort with a one-way street, but I think they wanted to keep the options open. I would agree. Okay. Well, I just was curious because I, I assume that was the fact that it was going into a, a grant um, application process. Um, so, okay. Thank you. And so, and just so you know, in the village's multi-year capital plan, it is programmed to be funded if and only if it gets grant funds. And the finance committee had a conversation about, hey, should we come up with a plan B? Because there was some support for trying to find a way to make that project happen. Like, do you re-engineer it and do, you know, kind of like block one light, if you will, like really focuses only on the north side of the street? Or could you, how could you trim it down to try to make that happen? So those conversations and, and the, the consensus was to pump the brakes and come back if and after we find out, because we should know by April, um, May, uh, we we'll hear from the state about whether that is awarded or not. No, I, that's that's very logical. I mean, let's see if it gets some traction yep. downstate and then go from there. Yep. If, if there really is no comments, I mean, you can All right. Joanna Rolick if she has any comments. Yeah. Too. Joanna, do you have anything that you'd like to, to add? Is she still there? There she is. There she is. Joanne, I think you just need to, there you go. There we go, there we go. Yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me. This has been fascinating to, to listen to and it resonates with me both as, uh, to Jeff's point, one of the residents who was on the interchange committee 20, I think it was more than 20 years ago, Jeff, that we started <laughs> talking about the 176 interchange. But at any rate, there were a couple of things that really resonated with me. And I have to particularly agree with Rob and Deb on a couple of things. Um, and that is, um, first of all, getting citizens involved with the goal setting because they need to understand what the goals are and then they need to understand from professionals, whether it's business consultants or other economic development and planning uh, professionals, they need to understand what the process is because what the public doesn't understand from my experience is unintended consequences. And the need to be able to stop and think about the goal and what it will take to get there and that there are some things that may not be what you want, but in order to achieve that goal, you need to implement those things. And then to Deb's point, the storytelling, I think is critically important too. And getting that message out and also the economic development stats. 
Um, I know that when I've had people who have gotten in touch with uh, the chamber looking for um, something within the village, um, getting some of that information, you know, I, I've got some, but having more of it or being able to direct them to the appropriate web page with statistics so that they understand the value of moving a business and coming in and starting something building something there that would be really great so know that you can count on us if we can be helpful in any way but i love the way this is going so thank you again for inviting me today i didn't see any of the background information so for me this was listening to your conversations and your comments was the first that i had uh, heard about this so um, happy to be helpful in any way that I can. Thanks for the opportunities to speak. Thanks, Joanna. Thank you. All right. Um, should we move on? Yep. You ready? Yep. Uh, let's see. Number seven <laughs> on the agenda is village administrator's report. And I think I I've sprinkled in throughout. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've done that. Yep. Uh, number eight, chair's report. Does anyone have a report this evening? Anything they want to share or any anything else they want to say? Nope. Okay. Uh, committee, I, I guess I'm the chair report. You That's are the chair. Me. Sorry, I have nothing to say. I'm done. <laughs> uh, number nine, committee members report. Now is when you all would, would be to share something if you'd like. <laughs> nothing? I think we've already covered that. Uh, so now we're on adjournment. Uh, can I get a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. Thanks, Deb. And a second? I'll second. Thanks, Rob. Thanks. Motion passes. Oh, you say all oh. in favor? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Motion Aye. passes. All right. Good uh, night. Good night. Have a great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good night. Thank okay. you. Good night. Good night.